200 years ago, English workers destroyed machinery that was making their jobs redundant. The Luddites, as they were called, weren't the first or last to view automation in threatening terms. And now, with robots and artificial intelligence advancing more quickly than a good science fiction novel, it behooves us to ask, have we struck any better a balance between the people and the machines? Let's find out. Joining us now in Palo Alto, California via Skype, Vivek Quadwa, Distinguished Fellow at Carnegie Mellon University's College of Engineering in Silicon Valley. He's the author of The Driver in the Driverless Car. In Boston, Massachusetts, James Besson, Executive Director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at the Boston University School of Law. And here in our studio, Krista Jones, Managing Director of Work and Learning at the Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto, and Avi Goldfarb, the Ellison Professor of Marketing at the Rotman School of Management at U of T and co-author of the forthcoming book, Prediction Machines, The Simple Economics of Artificial Intelligence. And we are delighted to welcome you two, I think for the first time, here to our studio at Young and Eglinton and to our friends out of town. Thank you for being with us as well. I want to just start by looking at some of the 2017 headlines about automation and work. And they certainly suggest a particular future is coming for us. Here's one from The Guardian. Robots will destroy our jobs and we're not ready for it. Here's from Vice News. Robots are coming for our jobs sooner than you think. Here's from The Huffington Post. Robots are coming for our jobs. Here are five ways to prepare. And our own National Post in Canada. Robots will take your job. Yes, you, with the university degree. For real, it's going to happen. Okay, James, it seems fairly apocalyptic, at least as far as some of the uh, major newspapers uh, and online services of this continent are concerned. Do you share the concern expressed in those headlines? I share a concern, but I think they are tending to emphasize the wrong thing. Uh, the, if you look at the Luddites, they were concerned more about the control over the innovation inventions, not so much whether they would have jobs. And in fact, if you look back at the history, uh, there was a heavy automation in textiles and other industries, and yet employment grew. The number of jobs grew dramatically. Uh, I think we face a similar thing today. The problem we're facing is not so much that the technology is going to come along and eliminate jobs overall. It's that it's going to eliminate some jobs and create others, or it's going to change the nature of work. And that itself is highly disruptive. Uh, it is a challenge. Uh, our societies aren't necessarily up to it, but it's not that we're going to be facing mass unemployment, at least not in the next 10 or 20 years. Vivek, what's your view on the apocalyptic nature of those headlines? Well, I, I see a lot of good coming from technology. They will have unlimited food, unlimited energy, be able to educate everyone. A lot of good will come from it. But yes, there'll be disruption and there will be many angry people. You're already seeing the anger you know, rising in many parts of the world. And there is a lot to be worried about. And, uh, and I think that um, we have five or 10 years when we'll be creating a lot of good jobs. After that, the robots start taking everything away and it does get pretty uh, dismal. So we've got to get ready for this jobless future. Can I make sure I heard you correctly? Yes, the robots are going to take everything away. That's what you just said. And, you know, almost every manual job can be done by robots, AI, wherever you require decision making and, and data analysis, even medical jobs, even the jobs of doctors are going to be decimated because you, you can have technology doing it better than human beings can. So yes, in, in that 10 to 15 year time period, you're going to wipe out the vast majority of jobs. There's no disputing that. Uh, Krista, do you care to dispute that? Um, I do care to dispute it a bit. Uh, when I look at what's happening in the headlines, the headlines are preying on a fundamental fear that people have about um, how are they going to do, which is an important part to most people's lives, which is their job and earn money. And the, 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 the headlines that I see happening today are really playing against that fear. And they're not actually based in the reality of how people are actually rolling out the technology in their companies. Because the technology that's coming, for the first time, it's actually impacting at the level of cognitive capability. So routine, manual was always where we played in the past. We're now getting at routine and cognitive type jobs that are going to cause disruption. So I'm kind of more in agreement with James than I am with Vivek in, in that I, I see the responsible application of technology causing disruption in a very much in the middle class area in some of the places where we haven't seen a lot of that disruption, although we've seen it happen in, in some sectors in the US. So I do see, I don't see the jobless future. I see a very changed future, but not a jobless one. 
Avi, are the robots coming for all our jobs? Um, so to be honest, the, the best work on this is by Jim, who's already uh, in studio, or at least online. In Boston. And in Boston. And um, it shows systematically and pretty clearly that we've heard this, we've seen this, this show before. And technology comes, and it destroys some jobs, and it creates others. And just like a whole bunch of people couldn't have imagined what uh, stagecoaches would do once the automobile came along. Um, it's you know, we don't know what people will do, and uh, you know, farm, most of our grandparents and great grandparents used to be farmers, and they're not anymore. And we're not farmers for the most part, but we still have jobs. I think the fear, though, is that yes, something always did come along in the past to satisfy our fears. We're not sure that's going to happen this time, and and we want somebody to tell us. Yes, don't worry, on balance, it'll all work out. And I, I certainly don't hear Vivek saying that, or many others for that matter. So, um, so I'll say that. Yes, you know, it'll all work out. That said, the long run can be a very long time. <laughs> and so in the short run, there can be you know, incredible problems. There can be an AI-induced uh, recession, because it comes along for a whole bunch of jobs at the same time. And there's a few years where things are not so good. That said. Uh, there's, there's an old um, economics model called the theory of comparative advantage, which says that as we get, um, it says the trade is good on average. Mm -hmm. And so imagine there's a, there's a country, say, called Robotlandia. <laughs> and the robots are better at everything than we are, okay? Just like you might imagine free trade and you know, another country is better at everything than we are. Our intuition says that we shouldn't trade with that country. We'd be better off without it. Uh, but, um, but David Ricardo and others have shown you know, over the last 200 years that on balance, we'll be better off with that trade. Uh, that said, as we know, trade causes a disruption too, and we should expect the same thing. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, James, what I'm gonna get you to comment first on the information I'm gonna put forward here because we're gonna put some numbers behind comments. Uh, Sheldon, let's bring these graphics up if you wouldn't mind. A 2013 report out of Oxford University says, Nearly half of jobs are at risk from automation. Nearly half. According to a 2016 Brookfield Institute report, existing technology could already automate 42% of the tasks that Canadian workers do at their jobs, leaving nearly half of Canadians at a high risk of disruption in the next decade or two. Researchers at the U of T's Mowat Center say anywhere from 1.5 million to 7.5 million Canadian workers could lose their jobs to automation in the next decade. Okay, that's one side of the coin. Here's the other side. Researchers at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation in Washington say the Oxford figure we just gave is just plain wrong. And only about 10% of the jobs in the 700 plus occupations studied are at risk of automation. And this echoes a recent report by the OECD that says only 9% of jobs across 21 different countries are under serious threat. And a 2015 paper by our very own James Beston here found that computer use is associated with less than, less than a 1% increase in employment annually. Uh, all right, J James, I, I, I guess I want you to weigh in on this notion of, we understand there's going to be disruption, but at the end of the day, make us, make our fears go away that we're not going to be dramatically worse off. Right, so the, the first thing that people get confused is when automation comes along and automates a task in a job, it doesn't mean that the job goes away or it doesn't even mean that there is less employment. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the automated teller machine, the ATM and bank tellers. Everybody assumed that this technology was going to come along. It automates the cash handling tasks of bank tellers and so everybody assumed we're going to just lose te bank teller jobs, and that's not what happened. What happened was this. Uh, it, it made it easier. This technology made it less costly for a bank to open up a branch, and that meant that bank banks could open up more branches in order to serve and deliver, deliver cash and other services to people in more remote locations. So they opened up a whole lot more branches because it, it was less costly to do so, and as a result, the number of bank tellers actually rose uh, from the period when, when ATMs were being installed rapidly from 1995 to 2005, roughly. Um, and the, the, the critical idea here is that demand is, is important, that as long as we have major unmet needs, new technology comes along and it may reduce the amount of labor needed to produce 
a unit of output or a, a unit of service, but it, the, the effect on demand will offset that uh, labor-saving effect, so that number of jobs does not necessarily decline and in many cases actually will increase. Okay, let me jump in. Vivek, you want to come back on that? Here's what the problem is with looking backwards. The changes we keep talking about, all of the stories we tell about agriculture and banks and so on, they happened over decades, sometimes over generations. And the jobs did disappear. People did become unemployed. There was, there was a lot of doom and gloom. The next generation got better educated. They took those jobs. Here we have many things happening at the same time. On the one hand, you now have robots that can do manufacturing. On the other hand, you have AI-based self-driving cars that are coming. Just the self-driving cars, when they hit, the self-driving trucks are going to come first. We're talking about three and a half million jobs in the United States directly from that. I don't know what the number in Canada is, but we're talking about millions of jobs. And then we have um, AI-based decision tools, which, again, start reducing the need for human labor. It's not that we're going to, it's going to disappear. It means we need less of those jobs. And then you go to retail. You're already now seeing the decimation of the retail industry in America, thanks to Amazon and their automated robots in their warehouses. That Amazon still employs you know, half a million people, but compared to the retail industry, it's employing a fraction of what they did. And soon, the rest of Amazon will be automated as well, so you need even fewer people doing the, the box packing and, and putting into trucks. So you're talking about, on a large scale, employ, I mean, um, uh, industry after industry being impacted, happening at the same time, within the same generation. But so Vivek, I do, see, I, I do see Amazon getting into the bricks and mortar business, uh, in, in bookstores, in food, et cetera. Does that but change they, your mind about anything? Yeah, but they're also now uh, looking at completely cashierless stores. Look at the, uh, the latest uh, you know, um, uh, prototype that they, that they built, which doesn't have a human being in it. So yeah, brick and mortar stores without any, any human beings. So this is happening over and over again because you don't need humans. Humans are expensive, they're cumbersome. And when you can have AI and robots doing it faster, it's all happening at the same time across the industry. So even if we create some new jobs, you know, the example that's often used is Zumba dancers and, and walker talkers and God knows what silly occupations. The unemployed truck drivers aren't going to be taking those jobs. They're going to be unemployed. Even today with manufacturing, we can bring manufacturing back to Canada from uh, China. The trouble is that we don't have the skilled people that can do all the manufacturing. And we can't take these unemployed people and now turn, turn them into uh, people who can man uh, manage the robots. So we have a big problem coming because everything at the same time. All right, I've got a follow-up question here for an expensive and cumbersome human being here on our set. Krista, the ATM example that James just gave, where everybody thought we were going to have fewer employees, but in fact, at the end of the day, we actually got more tellers. Um, in your judgment, an isolated incident or something that could work out over other sectors as well? So we got we to gotta understand the time when ATMs were introduced. So ATMs were introduced at a time when um, people were still not adopting technology at the rate and the, the ability that they have nowadays as consumers, the, the time to move to new technology and move to new capabilities is shortening dramatically. We're now measured in, in inside of a year most times in terms of how fast it takes off. But what's interesting about, um, about what's happening, if you look at the financial institution, um, before ATMs was just one part. Now if you look at the front of a bank's website and you look at everything it offers, because banks used to be, they used to offer everything. They do your mortgage, they do your business banking, they do your personal banking, they do your checking account, they do your savings, your RESP. Well, and that is now too. Well, and that is being unbundled. Mm -hmm. They are being attacked from all areas. So what we have is a bit of, I, I would say, a combination of both James and Vivek in that we have people being displaced from areas. I'm not quite as pessimistic, well, in fact, I'm not at all as pessimistic that you can't retrain people to do other capabilities and where they need to go. And I think that there's a lot of great work being done to look at that as institutions like manufacturing or, or financial services unbundle, you start to see this displacement of workers into different areas. And it's actually quite interesting when you start to move from a job market to a skills market, which is really where we have to get to as a society in the next five to 10 years, we have to stop identifying people as jobs and look at capabilities that they have. And the minute we start doing that, our imagination will free up so we don't say, a 
truck driver can't do this. Because I just disagree with that. When we actually sit down and look at the truck driver, not for what they've done in driving the truck, but for who they are and the skills that they have, we'll start to create the proper evolution path that will enable as a society to go from a jobs base, because everything's structured that way, mm -hmm. career paths, promotions, salaries, and we'll go from jobs based to skill based and we'll bring the human element into the labor market. So can you give us another example, Avi, of, uh, okay, the ATM is a good example. We thought we were going to have massive job loss. Turned out we actually got a few more jobs. Any other examples in that department? So the best one is farming, um, where, and it's, it's the best one for two reasons. So the ATM example is interesting because the jobs stayed in banking and stayed as tellers. But for the most part, when we have a new technology that makes an industry way more productive, the industry produces more, but employment in that industry could fall. Now, that seems like bad news, but it's not because we don't care about industries. We care about the people who work in the industries. And historically, whenever this happens, and, and we'll get to uh, what historically means in a second, um, we, whenever this happens, those people find jobs in adjacent industries pretty quickly. And when I mean historically, we can talk about farming and ATMs. We can also talk about the automation factories that's been happening over the last 10 years. And as factories have become automated, uh, there has been uh, disruption. But those people, for the most part, have found jobs relatively quickly within a year or two in adjacent industries, whether it's construction or services or something else. And so as long as we remember what we care about, or I think what we care about is the people who work in these industries and not the industry themselves itself, uh, then this better technology, increasing productivity is good news. James, I want to follow up with you because when Avi said historically, you laughed. How come? Well, I, I, I thought it was funny the way he phrased it. But I, I can give you some other examples, current day examples, uh, where you know, we see the same sort of thing. So, so Vivek talked about uh, retail. It's true that if you look at the number of department store employees, that's gone down. But Michael Mandel, the economist, has, has done some very nice work looking at the broader retail sector, including warehousing and fulfillment jobs. And what you see is that the Amazon and e-commerce revolution has actually increased the total number of jobs. If you look at another area, one of the big AI applications is in offices uh, doing what they call electronic discovery. In, in the U.S., uh, when there are lawsuits, we have, go have this very expensive process of uh, what's called discovery, where documents need to be produced. It can now be done through with electronic documents uh, on computers. It's a billion-dollar market, but the number of paralegals has actually gone up. Similar thing. Uh, barcode scanners came in. Everybody saw that it was reducing the amount of labor needed by cashiers, but the number of cashiers actually rose. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. We can definitely look at manufacturing jobs today and see where uh, automation has led to job losses, as Avi says. Um, but it's just simply not a, a, a very clear-cut case. And I think the critical thing is if you want to know what's happening in the next 10 years, uh, look at what uh, the startups are doing today. Look at, at what's going on at the, you know, at the very cutting edge of the technology. We're conducting surveys of uh, robotics implementations in manufacturing plants, of AI applications. And what you see overall is these are not about mainly, there, there are some exceptions like driverless cars, but these are mostly not about machines coming in and replacing humans, they're about machines coming in and augmenting or enhancing humans. They're, they're providing human workers with better tools to do a better job. And, and that doesn't necessarily lead to job losses, and it, it can actually lead to uh, increased employment. Vivek, I saw you shake your head in the middle of that, so I'm going to give you the first opportunity to respond to this next comment that I'm going to read from RBC's head of research and chief science officer, who says there's a human element to financial advice that is still extremely important to our customers. Technology is very important for tracking world events quickly for clients to see how it will affect their holdings, but we have to distinguish between knowledge and decision making and machines are nowhere near humans when it comes to higher reasoning. They're not ready to make decisions on their own. Vivek, is it possible that there are those jobs out there that require a level of thoughtfulness that AI or automation just can't do? Right. I want to make two comments. First of all, on these studies we keep citing. On the one hand, we're citing studies paid for by industry paid for by Amazon. We, uh, on the other hand, we're citing academic studies. The academic studies are showing the disruption happening. The uh, paid for studies are showing, hey, everything's going to be great. We're creating all these new jobs in retail. We're not. The numbers are shrinking, and the types of jobs we're creating are low-level 
you know, temporary jobs. The second thing is, as far as finance goes, today the robo-advisors are almost as good as human beings are. But if you look at the exponential curve that these technologies are, are on, you look at the ability of AI-based tools to analyze massive amounts of data that human beings can't, and you begin to realize that, you know, move forward three or four or five years, suddenly it comes to the point that we trust the AI more than we trust the human because the human is acting on limited data. That, uh, you know, human touch, when it comes to your finances, we won't really care about it. We care about our finances. So we still have another three or four or five years uh, when everything will be okay. But on the exponential curve, these technologies are getting better than our capabilities are. So every area I look at in the mid to long term, I see uh, humans being decimated in their, uh, in their jobs. Avi, one second. So um, just to, on the point about academic versus industry studies, most of those studies that we cited were absolutely academic studies, some done by, by us, but some done by the University of Wisconsin. And the, that Oxford study that you, you know, that's, that's the biggest headline, um, they're associated with Oxford, but they're, they're not professors. So it's not, it's not a traditional academic study, and it's certainly not peer reviewed in the way that we usually think about academic studies. And therefore not reliable? It could be reliable, but it's just as reliable as any of the other studies that Vivek is criticizing. Okay. We should take this offline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we'll do that later. Krista, the jobs in the finance industry, what do you think? Are they safe from automation? So, some are, some aren't. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really, what's really important is that we've got we've to remember that, that, that um, when you look at how the finance industry is organized and the way it's structured and the way we do business, um, I still think that people, to, to, to Vivek's point about that we will trust the AI more, I think technologists will. I think we're a long way from the average person who goes in and just does their job and is managing their money to getting to that point of being able to judge that. Because when we look at the data, sometimes investment isn't about what's going to make me the most money. It's about what fits my, my, my moral standards, what Your fits values. my values, what fits my ethical, I want sustainable. And I think those are things that from a judgment call perspective, take, it's going to take a long time to get built in to the AI capabilities that exist. But James, I think I need you to speak to this, which is the, the notion that because jobs were always created in the past, whenever there was some kind of uh, technological change, therefore it will happen again. That's comforting, but we don't really know that, do we? No, no. He, here's the argument. That's, that's not quite right. Okay. Jobs were not always created in the past. Jobs were sometimes destroyed. You can look at, you can look at the textile industry in the U.S., for instance, or most developed nations since the 1950s, jobs have been, automation has destroyed jobs. The, 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 the issue is this, uh, is the technology tapping into major unmet needs? If it's tapping into major unmet needs, then there's going to be a very active demand response and the demand is going to go up. Um, when you have a, a market like textiles, which t these days is highly satiated, you know, w you know, people have most of the clothing they need uh, you can drop the price and people aren't going to buy more cloth. Uh, that's where uh, automation will lead to job losses. But I tend to believe that there are huge areas, particularly in services, healthcare, uh, where uh, technology isn't meeting people's needs today, where there's vast areas where, where technology can uh, provide all sorts of new services and benefits, many of which I don't think we can even uh, imagine today. Um, and if that's the case, then it will be the case also that technology will create jobs in those areas. Not everywhere. There will be those older markets, more mature markets, where jobs will disappear. But what, what that leads me to, to see is it's not a story of jobs disappearing everywhere. It's a story of jobs disappearing in some industries, in some occupations, and other jobs being created, doing new and different things, or, or delivering new and different value in other industries and occupations. Sure, let, let me put this to Vivek, which is, we keep hearing about the gray tsunami that is coming our way. And one can imagine a future where we need a lot more personal care workers, personal service workers, dealing with uh, a, a much older a, a population that is living much longer and will need the tender loving care of an actual human being going forward. That's, that's a legitimate uh, prognostication, isn't it? I completely agree. So there will be some new jobs created. 
the trouble is that we keep talking about imagination. Every time you talk about, you know, every time we discuss jobs, everyone says, well, we'll create jobs they haven't even imagined yet. I'm sorry, but we don't have time to imagine. We only have five or 10 years before the tsunami hits us, and we haven't even come up with the idea of what they are. So we're talking about now imagining these new jobs, creating them, training people up, and providing employment for people who are going to be rapidly uh, unemployed. It's happening too fast. It's happening industry after industry, everything at the same time. It's happening much too fast. We can't look backwards and feel comfortable saying, hey, it was okay 100 years ago, therefore it'll be okay now. It never happened this fast before. And that's what the problem here is here. And I wonder, Avi, if that means this time it's different. So um, this won't be the, well, if there is a recession or even a depression because of, um, because of AI, that won't be the first technology-induced business cycle. But, he, but speak so, to the speed angle here. Vivek is saying that it's happening far faster than the Industrial Revolution 100 years ago, and therefore, this time, it's different. But the, the demand response, the other things, also are happening far faster now than they used to. Uh, the technology uh, spreads the information, um, has the adjustments to the uh, reactions to the business cycle. You know, things happen faster. That's both on the downside and on the upside. And we've seen that cycle all the you know, business cycles going back to the 19th century. Let's weigh in here with uh, an excerpt from Wired magazine. This is from James uh, Surowiecki, who was writing last month. The peculiar thing about this historical moment is that we're afraid of two contradictory futures at once. On the one hand, we're told that robots are coming for our jobs and that their superior productivity will transform industry after industry. If that happens, economic growth will soar and society as a whole will be vastly richer than it is today. But at the same time, we're told that we're in an era of secular stagnation stuck with an economy that's doomed to slow growth and stagnant wages. Both of these futures are possible, but they can't both come true. Fretting about both the rise of the robots and about secular stagnation doesn't make any sense, yet that's precisely what many intelligent people are doing. James, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I think it's historically been true that technologies take a lot longer to implement uh, than we imagine. Uh, there are lots of details to figure out. There are lots of adjustments and, and adaptations that need to take place. So you, you can look at uh, some of these revolutionary technologies of the past, and it's taken decades for them to have an effect on things like the productivity numbers. And, and that's what we're seeing today. We're not seeing uh, the productivity numbers rising so rapidly. Also, we can look back. You, you know, that, that Frey and Osborne paper that, that you started the session with uh, was written in 2013. And that paper claimed that as of 2013, jobs such as accountants or loan officers or judicial clerks were completely automatable at that time. So here are these jobs which are supposedly completely automatable, and here we are four, uh, nearly five years later already, and we're not seeing any of those jobs being automated um, completely. Th this there is are the Oxford automation. study that you're referring to. This, this is the, yeah, the Oxford study. The, uh, there, there are tasks that have been automated in these jobs, but that's been going on for 50 years. Um, you know, so the, the pace of change is, is it's very difficult to measure. It's very difficult to anticipate. But we're not seeing evidence that the, the pace, I, I think things are more disruptive for one reason that, that Vivek correctly identified, which is we're seeing more of the economy being affected by these changes than some of the technological changes in the, in the past. Um, but the the, the pace of change is not necessarily an order of magnitude different, uh, at least not so far. Vivek, there is an interesting dividing line shaping up here, which is to say economists seem relatively optimistic about things. Much doom and gloom seems to come from Silicon Valley. Uh, why do you think it's lining up that way? Right. First of all, it's not one or the other, because if you look at uh, the cost of energy, Look at solar in particular, it's dropping exponentially. And if you keep looking forward, with 18 to 20% drops every year, we're headed towards zero, almost unlimited clean energy. You have unlimited clean energy, you can have unlimited food being grown organically in, in vertical farms. You also now have automation making lives better. They will have robotic assistants looking after us. I mean, you can go, you know, technology after technology after technology and look at how the cost of everything is dropping and making our lives better. So this is happening. It's not a doom and gloom future. In fact, I see the opposite. I see the possibility of reaching Star Trek. Literally, the science fiction world we saw 300 years ahead of schedule. But I don't see that many jobs being there. 
Now, the question I would have us ask is, why do we need to work the way we did before? Why aren't we asking the question, why do we need to be working 50 hours a week in dull and boring jobs? Why can't we be working 10 and 15 hours a week and have all of our wants and needs met and focus on higher pursuits? So that's a discussion we need to be having is, what does it mean to have to work less and to have technology taking care of a lot of the problems we have, solving the grand challenges of humanity, not having hunger, not having disease, not having uh, uh, you know poverty the way we've had it. So these are all fixable problems now. It's good and bad at the same time. Can I ask you to just follow up briefly on that? Do you think the future you just described, where we all work a lot less, have more leisure time? I mean, we've been hearing predictions about this for, for decades and decades. Is that a potential future for us still? It is, and this is what my book is about, that I worry that um, we can, you know, we have the opportunity to create this amazing future. At the same time, we've got the doom and gloom and, and the joblessness and so on. So we have to start making choices. We have to start preparing for it. We can't be in denial saying, hey, look, 100 years ago, it was OK, or this study says this. No, we have to realize this is happening. Look, everything is advancing exponentially. So now how do we prepare for this new world of technology in which we have amazing, wonderful things, perfect health, unlimited energy. You know, we have all the food we want. At the same time, we don't have jobs. We have to prepare for this future and start making choices and uh, getting ready for this, uh, this amazing and scary world that we're heading into hmm. because we are going there. We can't deny it. Let's uh, just in our last few minutes here go across the Charles River, James, to uh, the other side, just north of you right now, and hear from uh, the MIT economist David Otor, who had this to say about this subject. Sheldon, roll the clip, please. The challenge that this phenomenon cre creates, what economists call employment pol polarization, is that it knocks out rungs in the economic ladder, shrinks the size of the middle class, and threatens to make us a more stratified society. On the one hand, a set of highly paid, highly educated professionals doing interesting work. On the other, a large number of citizens in low paid jobs whose primary responsibility is to see to the comfort and health of the affluent. That is not my vision of progress. James, we hear a lot about income inequality. We hear about the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. And this is a future, as laid out by this MIT economist, that seems to exacerbate that cleavage already. Does that concern you? Yes, it does. I think, I think that this is, gets back to what I think is the, the key issue. It's, it's not about having jobs at all. It's having uh, jobs that are fulfilling and well-paying uh, and equally distributed. Um, the, the, the pattern of technology of the last 20 or 30 years has been to increase inequality. And uh, I think the, the uh, momentum with these new technologies will exacerbate those effects. Um, and, and, and this is a great concern. But I think the, the answer to it is not to throw up our hands. The answer is, is to, to look at how we can help people transition uh, into better sorts of jobs. Uh, you know, you, you see it for, I mean, even you, you look at the bank tellers and you have to understand that their job has changed. It's not about uh, handling cash so much anymore. The bank teller has become a marketing person much more. It's, it's about communicating uh, the products that the bank has to offer, uh, providing assurances. Um, the, the interpersonal relationships become very important. That's part of the reason about why the bank tellers' uh, jobs went up. Um, when we see transitions like that happening, though, it's not exclusively about uh, professional jobs versus uh, uh, lower paid jobs. Uh, that's one important dimension. But we're also just seeing transitions of all sorts where people have to acquire new skills. Uh, we don't have a, a good system for people acquiring skills late in life. Um, you know, th this poses, I think, a, a tremendous challenge, tremendously disruptive, and a lot of people are going to be affected. In which case, in our last 30 seconds, that sounds like, Avi, we are going to be depending immeasurably more on folks like you and the rest of the educators in this province, country, and world uh, to help us through this. Are you guys up for this? Um, I think we are. So uh, as, as Jim just pointed out, the, the big issue is not so much how do we educate people through high school and university? We have been good at training people for the labor force, um, for the jobs that are appearing just as they graduate. And I think that's going to continue. The issue is we need to figure out a way to educate people after they turn 22. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're still not good at that. Uh, we, are, we are all working at it at the, at the high end level. In the business school, we do all these executive programs for people outside of, um, you know, outside of that age group. But um, we need to figure out a way to train everybody else. We're not there yet. 
Understood. I want to thank all of you for joining us on TVO tonight for a most interesting conversation. Vivek Wadwa, Carnegie Mellon University's College of Engineering, James Besson, Boston University School of Law, Avi Goldfarb from the Rotman School of Management at U of T, Krista Jones from Mars. Great to have you all on our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.